Welcome to Status Check with Spivey, where we talk about life, law school, law school admissions, a little bit of everything. Everything today is going to be U.S. news rankings. And let me just be clear. There was a lot of volatility and a lot of what people have been calling compression, which just means a number of ties. The volatility happened outside the T14. There were only three changes within the T14. The volatility was entirely expected and forced. So what do I mean by that? Expected because the methodology changed. Forced because U.S. News didn't sit down and say, we're going to change the methodology. No, a boycott happened and they had to change the methodology. Historically, we have seen one or two schools from time to time opt out of submitting data for various reasons. But in these one or two cases, U.S. News has ascribed scores to them. There's a system, my data analytics director, Justin Kane, could describe the system. You take the median and then you do one standard deviation or something from the median. We'll correct it in the show notes. Or more ideally, we'll do a part two with the hyper nuance. But when you have 62 schools or whatever dropping out, you can't, there is no more median of schools, right? There's no more mean of schools. The power of the data is too displaced. So you can't do this anymore. So U.S. News basically had to rely on publicly available data and then their own assessments. So they were forced to make these changes. And because there were changes, there was a high degree of volatility. All of that said, I'm not going to talk about the school changes. It's silly in a normal year, right? If a school goes from five to six, are they one worse or one better? No, they're the same exact school. It's silly, particularly in this year, because we knew that wild changes were occurring because of methodological reasons. As I've pinned on the top of our Twitter account, every year is a bad year to make matriculations decision based on one year rankings changes. This is the worst year ever. Another thing I've hit on a number of times is I've interviewed two hiring partners at major law firms. Neither could name the top 10 schools or come close. Neither cared about one-year fluctuations. I used to be a dean of career services. I haven't just done admissions. And a little hobby of mine was to ask managing partners and hiring partners if they could name the top 10 law schools to date. And I'm talking now over 100 people I've asked, hiring partners, managing partners. None have been able to name the top 10. Why is that? Because they don't care about one-year fluctuations. They tend to think in terms of brand recognition and prestige, and they tend to think of brand recognition and prestige based on when they went to law school versus one-year fluctuations. So I still see this question popping up a lot. I was thinking about going to X school. Again, I'm not going to name a single school in this podcast vis-a-vis rankings. I might talk about schools vis-a-vis the boycott. But yeah, if your school dropped 15 points, a hiring partner is incredibly likely not to notice. So if I'm not going to talk about school changes, what am I going to talk about? I just want to give everyone the inside baseball backstory to all of this. So months ago, Yale Law School was the first. They boycotted the rankings. What does that mean, boycotting the rankings? It doesn't mean they stood outside U.S. News' headquarters in D.C. and pick it with signs. It simply said that, look, there's a whole chunk of data we prepare for you every year for you. We do your work and we submit that data that's never shared with the public. That's never third party audited. A big one that comes to mind is expenditures per student, which incidentally, kudos to Yale on this account. They did very well on expenditures per student, but they stopped submitting that data. So Yale started on the same very day. And now we get to start getting into conspiracies. The same very day, Harvard also boycotted. Now, obviously, the dean at Harvard Law School and the dean at Yale Law School know each other. I'm not an antitrust lawyer, nor do I believe that they did this entirely in concert. I do think it's very possible that at some conference they discussed the absurdity of the rankings, particularly the private, obscure, non-third-party audited data. So when Dean Heather Gerken at Yale decided not to submit. Again, I don't particularly like the word boycott, but decided not to participate in the rankings. It might make sense that Dean Manning at Harvard said, oh yeah, we've been thinking about this all along. Let me tell you this, a number of deans of law schools had been tossing around the notion of not submitting, not participating. So I didn't hear it first from Heather Gerken, who I don't know. I heard it first years ago from 
a certain dean and then I heard it from other deans. But when the number one school does it, you're now afforded to also not participate. And that's what happened. I believe it's 62 schools ultimately ended up not participating, which still means a majority of schools did, some more so than others. Shout out to Dean Rutledge at Georgia, who I think has submitted his data for next year's already, but many didn't. So there was a forced methodological change. What were the changes? This is where I think things get interesting. They still remain controversial, but I think better because it's, again, this is now transparent and out there and it's more outcomes weighted, which I think is a benefit, although there's also a correlation between inputs and outputs. So who knows? So previously, or last year, I shouldn't say previously, because U.S. News tinkers with the methodology every year. They just had to make the most changes in their history this year. So student outcomes used to be 26%. They're 58% now. That kind of all off guard, by the way. I don't know a single expert in this area that thought that the outcomes would go this high, but they did go sky high. Employment 10 months outside of graduation was 14% of the rankings, 33% now. And I'm going to click on that later because it's a particular interest to how schools may change what they do. So employment 10 months out, 14% to 33%. Employment at graduation, a, a number as a former dean of career services, I always hated 4% to not counted. That's good. I remember graduating from undergrad and living in my parents' basement until I got a job. A lot of people don't have jobs at graduation. If you're listening to this, you might have memories of that too. First year, first time bar passage was 3% previously and is now a whopping 18%. Two-year ultimate bar passage is a new category. So last year, it wasn't a category. This year, it's 7%. They got rid of graduates with student loans category. They got rid of the average debt of graduate with loans category. So that's all in the outcomes. In the student selectivity, the arena I swim in most of my professional career, basically this means admissions. Median LSAT, which had already been dinged down a little bit, so we didn't think they would knock it down anymore because they had 21% of data that vanished that they had to reallocate. They had to put in 21% more. So we didn't think that they would play around with selectivity much, but they did. Median LSAT, 11.25% went down to 5%. Median undergraduate GPA from 8.75% to 4%. Acceptance rate is almost a rounding error. It's 1% at state at 1%. So that's selectivity in law school parlance. The what's called assessment scores, peer assessment went from 25% to 12.5%. Some people are not going to be happy with that. By people, I mean some law schools. The lawyers and judges assessment went from 15% to 12.5%. I think it's worth noting one of the big criticisms of these metrics, which are the only ones we don't know. These are based on surveys and U.S. News collects the surveys. I would claim, based on their statements, that it's my First Amendment right to share their surveys with me, but it's not. So no matter what U.S. News says about the First Amendment, they don't have to share their surveys with me. One of the criticisms is that if you're a dean of a law school, and there's four people at law schools that do these peer assessments, one of which is always the dean, one of which is always, I believe, the newest tenured faculty member. So let's say you're the newest tenured faculty member, and you have to fill out a peer assessment for over 190 schools, do you really know if you're Drexel on the East Coast, said I wouldn't use school names, that a school on the West Coast that's not even near a competitor of yours in any respect, do you know if they're ranked a one or a five? I believe that's the rating system the deans fill out. No, you don't really know the granular differences between these schools. That's always been, a, I guess, a silly metric that people have been uncertain why they had placed so much weight into it. So they reduce the weight into that metric. Same thing for judges. I mean, do judges really know the granular difference between X school and Y school across the entire all ABA accredited law schools? No, it's a survey with a poor response rate, now an even more poor response rate. Again, I think some people are going to be pretty critical of this, some academics, but I actually think this was another good move. There's the resources category. So you had student to faculty ratio, which went from 2% to 5%. So that went up probably a good thing. There is research that supports that smaller classroom environments create better learning opportunities. And what U.S. News is really wanting to get at ultimately is what they do a little bit more in undergrad rankings, which is throughput. So measuring how well a student does based on when they enter the school versus 
when they exit the school. An example would be a throughput at the undergraduate level would be something like test scores relative to graduation rate and employment. In theory, that measures throughput. Another word for this is predictive metrics. It gets pretty complicated, though. So let's say you wanted to do LSAT relative to bar passage as a feature of U.S. News will report predictive metric. What you want, then, is the best delta, the lowest LSAT relative to the greatest bar passage. So you can see a school saying, all right, we've done the numbers and the max LSAT for this metric, given that LSAT itself is now 5% and maybe even dropping if they start using predictive metrics, our optimized LSAT is a 168 if we want to optimize for predictive bar passage and employment. I don't know if U.S. News is going to go. I'm getting a little more nuanced than I wanted to. The student-to-librarian ratio went from 1% to 2%. I literally don't have an ability to comment on that. It's something I know a little about, but I've never been a librarian. The average expenditure per student, 9% to boom, zero. Again, because so many schools got rid of that metric, the average financial aid per student, 1% to zero. Okay, so what does this all mean? You have a whole methodology You had Yale and then Harvard and then many other schools bouncing out of the rankings. It means a lot of things. Let me just go back in time a little bit. For many, many years, U.S. News had all this leverage, and they didn't really pay much attention to law school's suggestions. This is not me, Mike Spivey, saying this. This has been a complaint of law schools and law school deans ever since U.S. News started getting more prevalent and merit aid started going up which was an arms race to buy LSAT scores because LSAT scores were weighted more heavily, but they're also a discrete category, right? A 168 is different than a 169 or a 167, although even that's a little bit interesting because U.S. News has put them in bandwidths, but a GPA of a 3.5 is worse than a 3.58, worse than a 3.6, better than a 2.48, 2.49. So discreteness in these metrics mattered more and more as more and more people started paying attention to U.S. News and World Report rankings. Faculty salaries went up. That student expenditure. I think my favorite tweet ever, or most interesting or curious or one I wanted to respond to, but probably because I don't like drama, didn't, was a faculty member a couple of years ago said something like, they were at Columbia, and they said something like, it's great my school's ranked in the top four or whatever, top five which they aren't anymore, but not at the expense of 72,000 whatever dollars tuition per year. Where do you think 70% of that 72,000 goes to? Roughly 70%. Faculty salaries. So I've yet to see the tweet from a faculty member. It's great that my school is ranked number four, but not at the expense of $70,000 tuition. And I'm willing to take 33% pay cut because I think the tuition is out of hand. I won't go off on lack of understanding of U.S. News and World Report. No one has a perfect understanding. Certainly not U.S. News will get into all their mess-ups, which were extraordinary. Not just butchering the United States Constitution, but data mistakes. So you go back in time, the rankings become more prominent. More money is given out to high scorers because this was a margin that you could really improve on. And there were margins. I think the biggest margin was your student-to-faculty ratio. Even though it wasn't weighted the highest, decreasing class size, floated a ton of boats. It floated your entering metrics, GPA and LSAT. It floated your output metrics, employment and bar passage. If you're more selective and you have less students, your GPA and LSAT are going to go up. It's going to be easier to place them. Obviously, your student to faculty ratio gets better. And if you're more selective, you're probably going to have a better bar passage. I mean, if you were a dean of a law school two years ago or even right now today, my message to you would be decrease your class size if you can, if you care about the rankings. You probably want to care about students first and foremost, but even smart class sizes are probably better for your school. So it's always been the easiest thing to do is tell law schools, if you can, decrease your class size and it floats a lot of boats, it's student value added. So over time, more precedent to rankings to the point where it's so sad to say, but people got, it's called the tribute-based esteem. People derived an incredible amount of esteem, students, faculty, et cetera, by being able to say, I work at the fourth ranked school. I went to the fourth ranked school. I'm very much a rarity. I kept going from schools that were ranked higher to ranked lower in my academic career and turned down jobs at higher ranked schools. And the reason why I did that It's multifaceted. I don't want to say it was all noble, but I always thought that you could make more of a change at a lower rank school than the highest rank school. There's just a lot of people that to this day will still over 
fine point. I'm trying to be polite with my language because I don't know people in almost none of us have unconditional self-esteem, right? So esteem falls in the four categories, performance-based, that's my issue. Did I beat that person in a race, et cetera? Other-based, did that person upvote my account? Did they smile at me? And attribute-based. And I think the attribute-based esteem part, which is what our global economy would collapse if we didn't have this, so I'm not being judgmental, I think rankings really hinged on anyone who had a lot of attribute-based esteem rankings overly influence those people. So it all changed with the boycott. As far as the methodology to be determined about the dominance of the rankings and how much they impact behavior. But I've been asked this a lot in the last week. I've been asked by law school deans, I've been asked by the media, and I've been asked by applicants. And I'm going to get to the applicant part too, which I think is important to most of our listeners. I think the best question came from Karen Sloan of Reuters, which is, is US News going to lose their dominance? Everyone's asking that. Or has this forced them to clean up, my words, not hers, clean up their data so much that they will be a better organization going forward? And I think the answer is both. So five months ago, after the boycotts, the non-participating schools, I actually didn't think U.S. News was going to lose any of their dominance because I think for evolutionary reasons, humans are hardwired for things that are ordinarily ranked. It just cleaned up noise and we need to clean up most of the external noise for many reasons. And that's hardwired in our brains. People like rankings and I thought that people were going to still like rankings. Honestly, if they had not said a word during this entire process, other than we're listening to schools, which they did, they talked to a hundred schools. I don't think they did much listening. They did much of the talking. I've talked to probably the majority of deans who were on these Zoom calls, and then there was a conference. I think U.S. News did most of the talking. They loved to call themselves journalists and data scientists. I'm not quite certain they listened to schools. I think they did damage control by talking to schools. So this was over the last six months. U.S. News had a series of gaffes in the media. Their chief data scientist, Bob Morse, if anyone has proof of life on Bob Morris, we haven't seen him tweet in two years, said, and I believe it was the Wall Street Journal, that basically they get the data and then they wait the data. And then every day the scientists on the planet that saw that quote said that's the exact opposite of how you do it. So they had that incredible gaffe. Obviously, a lot of deans were like, well, does that mean you're just trying to keep certain schools at the top if you're getting their data and then waiting how important it is? There was a panel in Lafayette College Shout out to Lafayette. I almost went there to play baseball. I signed a letter of intent. And so Eric Gertler, the CEO of US News says, I do view that the schools that didn't participate in our survey as not providing or fulfilling the First Amendment. That's like the exact opposite. And I'm not even a JD and Gertler is. The First Amendment doesn't relate to for-profit businesses. They can't demand data. I can't say to U.S. News, all right, I'm going to rank media sources. So here's my survey. You have to fill it out and get it back to me or you're violating my First Amendment rights. In fact, part of the First Amendment is your right to not speak. They have every right to say, buzz off, Spivey. We're not going to fill out your survey. I can't say to U.S. News and we'll report, okay, I know your embargo's out. Here's my survey. Fill out the rankings and get it back to me or you're violating my First Amendment right. This was, to me, the bridge too far. In other words, up till this point, even with the Bob Morse gaffe, even with two years ago, the data eras that had U.S. News change their listed rankings, I still thought U.S. News was going to maintain their dominance. But after this first amendment debacle, I've never seen not just law school deans, but college presidents weigh in and be like, this is just spin that's a butchering of the U.S. Constitution and enough is enough. Someone, please, whether it's law schools themselves or an outside entity or my rank by Spivey, it's free. It's not free to me, but we have one where you get to pick your own weights. Please, someone fill this vacuum because U.S. News is going bananas with the way they're speaking about the U.S. Constitution. And just wait, because to be determined, U.S. News seems to think that a viable business strategy is getting into this debate in defense of their rankings. So what do we have in late June or early July? We have SFFAD Harvard, the SCOTUS affirmative action case coming up. And U.S. News has danced about this a little bit without directly commenting on it because of the political orientation of the Supreme Court. We know how the Supreme Court is going to weigh. We just don't know how strong the opinion is going to be written. But U.S. News might try to use this as a talking point in their new rankings. 
the Supreme Court said this, so we're going to do this. But it's all wrong, right? Their butchering of the First Amendment is entirely wrong. The way they claim to do data is entirely wrong. And then here's the third point, and this is just beyond the pale. For the second time in three years, they messed up their own data to the point where we're 97.9% sure, I just made that number up, probably higher, that they had to bring in an outside auditor to clean up their data for them. And there still may be an error in there, or two or three. So this delay was not based on U.S. News saying, okay, schools, you're paying more attention, so we're delaying. The delay was based on data errors. And it's even more embarrassing because for the first time, to my knowledge, they posted their own top 14 online. The theory being, I don't necessarily pin much on the first theory that they were trying to prevent leaks. There's been leaks most years of the rankings. But the second is, in a year where they estimated they really needed attention and they really needed a boost, they were trying to spark more interest in their rankings by posting the top 14 and saying, okay, coming out later are more rankings. <laughs> but this is the worst of several years to have done this because then they had to pull the top 14 that they publicly posted. They had to pull their embargoed rankings that they sent to every single law school. They had to take three weeks. And this should have been done in like, I don't know what auditor they hired, but this should have been done in three days, not three weeks. They had to take three weeks to clean up their multi, multi faceted data errors. And they made their lives more difficult for themselves because let me give you an example. For non participating schools, they counted some metrics, but then they didn't count other metrics. So you take basic arithmetic and then you make it a little more convoluted, introduce a little bit more data errors. There's a three week delay. They finally deliver a new embargoed list. So I'm going to end with the US news dominance question. Is U.S. News going to be as dominant as they were in the past? I am at best 50%. And if any media or respected source out there comes up with a ranking, I think deans of law schools and college presidents are going to almost want to psychologically because they're so disturbed by U.S. News. So maybe they lose their dominance. I think they actually will if anyone fills the vacuum. I do think in the future they're going to hire an independent second entity to do the same modeling independently than the modeling they do so that they can line up when they get all the data. Okay, where are the differences? And there will be, by the way. And then they can immediately fix the differences so they don't have to send out an embargo, blame schools that the embargo is delayed, and then fix their own data that they caused, and then three weeks later send out a different embargoed list. So I do think the data is going to be cleaned up and more accurate. And I actually personally think, and this will transition to the final part about how this impacts students, Dean Tobin, who was the dean in Maryland and is, by all accounts, a great guy, wrote an article about the new metrics and how they hurt students. I don't necessarily disagree with him. A lot of what he said in his article is things I've been saying with deans of law schools with our firm internally. So I actually do agree with him. I guess my only point is, number one, the old metrics also hurt students. So students were hurt by this student expenditure data point because it increased tuition, it increased how much it costs to go to law school. So I think the old methodology hurt. I think the new methodology hurt. I think rankings hurt, which is why we've come down pretty hard against them, even though our firm makes money off of rankings. I think that confuses some people. And I'm not going to like overly fine point this because it sounds like an advertisement for my firm and I don't mean it to be. I just have a principled disagreement with the rankings. It started when I was at law schools and I saw people treating people different that went to lower ranked schools. And then it got heightened when I started helping people make law school decisions. And I saw people turn away huge amounts of money. It's slightly lower ranked schools for great indebtedness. It's slightly higher ranked schools with no job output differences. The rankings impact behavior at a supersized level that I think harm applicants. I think they take a small number of faculty members and they harm the way they treat other people. I've never particularly loved the rankings, but they're still here. If they get diminished, they're going to impact how law schools make decisions. But let's just stick with the knowns. They did decrease LSAT by 5%. They did decrease GPA by 4%. So there's a lot of concern that resources are going to shift from merit aid to buy LSAT scores and GPAs, which is an impolite way of saying the reality. Of, that's what merit aid does. To buying students' jobs, incidentally, not necessarily a bad thing. You can have student-funded jobs and they count toward the employment. But let me just counter that. And I know Dave Kloren on his Power Score podcast quoted me on this. So I'm just saying what Dave and I talked about. And Dave graciously gave my opinion. Begin with change in 
legal education is incredibly slow. Some of my best friends in the world are deans of the mission. When you go to LSAC conference, which is in two weeks, people always ask you, like, what's your median asset? That's not going to change. There's still this behavioralistic, psychological, huge point on your school. Your inputs are derivatives of your LSAT score. So in the short term, because change is slow and because LSAT is still used as a measurement amongst professionals, I don't see this like resource allocation shifting overly away from buying LSAT scores. It's funny because they're not mutually exclusive, but they sound mutually exclusive. So should law schools for rankings purposes, if they care about rankings and if US News stays dominant, should they shift in a world of limited resources, which is the case for essentially everyone, should they shift resources away from merit aid towards student funded jobs? Should they? Yes. Are they talking about it already? Yes, to a certain extent. Will they? Probably not in the short term. But the other thing is, and I'm going to end on this note, I think it's a really strong note to end on. I think the methodology next year, when U.S. News has a lot more time, I've been hard on them, but it's kind of like how I was really hard about LSAC when they obscured the LSAT flex scores. They didn't obscure them. They kept saying the bubble at the top was going to go down, even though they had the data to prove the bubble at the top could not go down, that the three-section LSAT flex had yielded higher test scores than any previous test. On the flip side, LSAC did have to shift because of COVID to online overnight, and they did. So U.S. News did have to shift almost overnight because of the boycott, because of the non-participating, and now they have time. I think more schools are going to, quote, boycott. So I think U.S. News is going to come up with a different methodology. So you almost could see a scenario where they look at the methodology and they look at the weights and they say, whoa, we went too far down on LSAT, too far down on GPA. Now the rankings are going to be utterly compressed. So we need to change this thing again. Point being, I think most of the people who listen to me talk for 35 minutes may have listened to hear about the admission side of things. I don't think merit aid, which has almost always been used for numbers, I don't think merit aid is going to change. There's a highly respected deed of admission. I'm going to do a podcast, I believe, in the near future on rethinking admissions. I personally think interviews are going to take on even more prominence or much more prominence. How you interview with a law school is going to correlate with how you interview with an employer, which is going to correlate with job outcomes. So I think interviews might take on a huge amount of significance, but I don't know. If you're an admissions consulting firm, maybe you should be celebrating because soft should matter more, but I'm not ready to declare that yet because I think a lot of change is still the common methodology and no one, no matter how confidently they state it online, they tweet it, or they blog about it, no one quite knows what's going to happen within the next year. My best guess is that merit aid is going to stay at nearly the same level. And my best guess is U.S. News will lose some dominance, but maybe not much, particularly if no one fills the vacuum that they've created amongst themselves. This is Mike Spivey, the Spivey Consulting Group.